in Acts chapter 4. We will start with our first point, establishing the treasury, but the lesson is about the the needy saints in the first century and the gift that went from all the churches back to Jerusalem in the time of their famine. So in Acts chapter 4, we begin with the establishment of the treasury. The first point about this is that they, the church has a treasury and it is built in this way. So let's look at the treasury and how it's built. Then we'll look at what they did and how we know about it. But Acts 4 is the first place and at verse 32 it says the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul and no one said that any of the things belonging to him was his own but they had everything in common and with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was on them all and there was not a needy person among them for all who were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Um, and I, uh, well, it, it's clear these. this is a, an unusual circumstance here. It is the church immediately after Pentecost, where a lot of Jews had traveled to Judea from other countries to worship, you know, to be there for the uh, festivals. And when they obeyed the gospel and the, the good news that came down from heaven in Acts chapter 2, they stayed there where they had not been planning to stay that long. And now they're actually relocating there. So they have sold off their holdings in their, wherever they came from and are now staying here in Judea and the proceeds of their sales are coming in to the treasury of the congregation. So this is how they established it. But the rules, um, I think, are, are clearer with a little bit better translation. I prefer to do it this way um, at uh, verses uh, 34 and 35. Um, I would do it I would say all who had been owners of lands or houses used to sell them and bring the price of what was sold and place it at the apostles' feet. It would then be distributed to whoever had, to whoever had need. And that, was, that is more like it, meaning they, they had been owners of houses, they sold them and brought it to the apostles, and then it would be distributed to whoever had need. Um, what is being said here in the original that is hard to get out, uh, get across in translation is that there's this ongoing presence of uh, what we would call a treasury, but there's this ongoing presence of money there at the apostles' feet so that whenever a need would arise, they would meet it from that ongoing presence of money. Um, so it's, that's the establishment of the treasury in that sense, that when they put the money at the apostles' feet, it lived there, so to speak, and was ready to respond whenever a need would come up. And that was the distribution. Um, so this is the idea of it. And we know that uh, even though you know, people selling off their homes and, and staying in Jerusalem was an unusual circumstance because... It's the beginning of the gospel. It's the start of the church. The truth is nowhere else on planet Earth. Um, we're not in that situation. But we do know that the treasury continued uh, beyond that. 1 Corinthians 16 tells you as much, uh, where Paul instructs the church at Corinth, which is way over in Greece. I mean, it's maybe one of the farthest extents of his travels. But 1 Corinthians 16 the treasury did continue after that original time when everybody was relocating to Judea. Um, because it is written there, on the first day of every week, 1 Corinthians 16, 2, each of you is to put aside something and store it up as he may prosper so that there will be no collecting when I come. This is an ongoing thing as well. 
The first day of every week, each of you put aside something, store it up. And here is what should be said about that. Um, again, I, I prefer a different translation here, which would be uh, more along the lines of each one of you must put any gain next to himself, storing it, storing it, you know, set it aside, storing it. Um, the point of that, setting it next to himself or setting it aside, but still under his control, storing it or treasuring it. The point of that is that you are earmarking the money. Um, I think in accounting, they maybe say encumbered funds. Um, or perhaps if it's in prospect, it's budgeted. I'm not real sure. I'm not good at accounting. But um, there's something along these lines that says this money has been dedicated. It has been earmarked. So what he's saying about the contribution is that when you receive gain, um, whether that is you know, your pay or whatever, however you receive gain, perhaps a gift, perhaps an investment, comes back with uh, posts of gain or something, whenever you come into more money, basically, you set aside God's portion. That's what he's saying. And this is put into the treasury on the first day of the week. So when we come together as the saints on the first day, there is opportunity to give um, what, ha what you've already set aside for God from what you gained. That's the idea. Um, it, I guess, should be said as well that when we um, store things, uh, it compares to Matthew 6, 19 to 20, where he said, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. And it's the same idea, that lay up or store or treasure that's used here in 1 Corinthians 16. So you're, you're, you know, there's some forethought to this, there's some plan, but there's, the idea is that you've earmarked it for God. You've got to gain, and you're taking God's part of this first. And that gets set aside, and it's protected, and it's going to go to him at the next assembly of the saints. That's the idea. But then there's also this idea, uh, what he says, as he may prosper. Each put something aside, store it up, as he may prosper. Um and this prospering is something that comes up in 3 John uh, as well. 3 John verse 2, he said, Beloved, I pray that all may prosper or go well with you and that you may be in good health just as it goes well or prospers with your soul. 3 John 2, right. I pray it may prosper, that all may prosper with you and that you're, you may be in good health just as your soul prospers. So the, you know, the spiritual prosperity is a good thing, of course, and is different from earthly prosperity. The two are not linked, actually. But he, he's making it okay for us to be concerned for these things. It's okay for us to pray for health. It is okay for us to pray for what we need to provide for ourselves and our families. And to be able to give more richly to God. Um, you know, this is an okay thing, but this idea of prospering should be taken into account as well, that when you make more, then you give more. That's true. But in times when you don't make money, you know, perhaps you're not able to give, or you have to give something uh, that is smaller than you would normally do as your portion. But whatever it might be, that prosper idea is controlling. So if you make more, then God should make more. And uh, there may be room as well for the idea that when you don't have it, well, you don't have it. And uh, this also is something that God accounts for. I think people sometimes get the idea that we need to have... Um, 
you know, interest uh, or, you know, investments that, you know, the money should be given to the bank to go and make more money with it. Um, and that's an interesting idea from the perspective that financial pundits would say that that's the smart thing to do with your money. However, um, you know, what it really says is when you prosper, the Lord prospers. Uh, you know, interest on investments is coming back from the returns of the work that the people in those companies are doing, <laughs> uh, right? So if you're working and you're getting compensation for your work, then God is also getting compensation for your work. You know, we don't take the money and invest it. You're the investment. <laughs> you give God his return. Right? That, that's the real truth of it. And the other thing is that, you know, interest doesn't happen overnight uh, unless you're a bank. Uh, it doesn't happen overnight. It takes a long time. And I can think of no reason why we should be sitting on uh, enough money that it matters whether we got interest on it for a long time until every faithful teacher of God's word is fully supported, every widow uh, who is faithful to God is fully cared for and fed. Right? Until that has been taken care of, I don't see hanging on to the money and caring about whether it doubles in seven years. <laughs> That's the wrong, you know, got the emphasis on the wrong syllable. Uh, so that's not it. The idea is that you're the investment. All right. Now, that being said, in, um, in Acts 6, where we were last speaking about the widows, there is an important distinction that is made there that we ought to look at, which is verse 4. Verse 4, the apostles said, we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. This they say, after having said in verse 2, it is not right that we should give up the word of God to minister ye of tables. The word is deaconing, to, uh, deaconing, which is ministering or serving or waiting. And uh, it is a word that means through the dust so somebody who gets dirty, which could be your server, your waiter, that's true. Uh, they said, it's not good that we give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. And then they said, in verse 4, we devote ourselves to prayer and to serving the word. So they're not serving food. They're serving the word. But it's the same word, the same deaconing word, the service or, uh, you know, waiting on somebody. The deacons are overseeing that work of, of uh, feeding the widows. But the apostles are overseeing the work of feeding the souls of the church, right? And this is uh, to say there's a difference between the spiritual and the physical, the literal, you know, uh, waiting tables and the spiritual waiting tables at the table of the Lord. But it's interesting because it introduces the idea that the deacon's office is intended to serve or to wait on things. Specifically, it was uh, conceived and uh, delineated here in Acts 6 in order to take care of the widows who were enrolled. And we don't read about the rules of their enrollment until we read 1 Timothy 5. Now, they had it already. It just hadn't been written down. Um, we have it written down in 1 Timothy 5. But they had widows, they were enrolled, and the church was responsible for feeding them because they were enrolled. And the apostles appointed deacons to oversee this matter. That's their purpose, their de the deacons. But it seems clear that they did other things as well. Now, when we look at Acts 11, because the same deaconing word, um, you know, it's, it's a verb in, in Greek <laughs> as well as a noun, but it's a, it's a verb to deacon. To de I don't know what you would say, to deacon, to deaconate, to deaconize, I don't know. But to serve, to wait tables, to... Uh, to get dirty, to work, manual labor. In Acts 11, 
we begin to see that the word is also used for financial aid. It's used for the relief for the saints in Jerusalem. All right, so in Acts 11, uh, verse uh, 27, you have in these days prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, Agabus, stood up and foretold by the Spirit there would be a great famine over all the world. And this famine did take place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send deaconry to the brothers living in Judea, send relief, which they did by sending, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. Now, it's interesting that they did this by sending it to the elders in Jerusalem. We'll talk about that later, perhaps. But for now, we take note that the word is deaconing, deaconric, whatever, deaconia, uh, relief. They are sending relief to the saints. It means, you know, if you're thinking about the, the widows who need help, whether it's, you know, they, they can't get out of their homes or they can't do the serving any longer because they're physically unable or whatever it might be, the church is deaconing them is caring for them providing at a very low level the physical needs that they have so also it's used here for the relief of the saints in judea who are suffering because of a famine arising in that region so what is it they're going to do comes to mind right now we begin to see well there's this thing that's happening the churches that are not in judea have decided, as it says, the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea, which they did, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. So they decided they're going to send money, but it's called deaconing. <laughs> it's meant to serve. Then, in 2 Corinthians 8, we should do this. So, you know, Antioch is relatively close to Judea. you got to go, you know, around the, the shore of the Mediterranean all the way over to Greece before you hit Corinth. But even out here in Corinth, 2 Corinthians 8, verse 1 we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the, church, the churches of Macedonia, which includes Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea. Right? Those are the churches of Macedonia. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. Now, it's interesting to note that they had extreme poverty when we know that Philippi was the only church that supported Paul as he preached in Greece. Philippians chapter 4 tells you so. That's interesting. But it says they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And that's your deacon word, your deaconing of the saints. It's the same word that's used in Acts chapter 11. And this, not as we expected, they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. Right, so he writes Corinth saying, look, Macedonia has given and they gave beyond their means, but they wanted to support Judea. That's the idea. They wanted to give back to Jerusalem, who are suffering in a famine. Then you read in chapter 9, uh, it's superfluous now for me to write you about the ministry for the saints. And that's the deaconing. For I know your readiness, about which I boast about you to the people of Macedonia, saying Achaia has been ready since last year. And your zeal stirred up most of them too. 
Now, if we go down to the 11th verse of 2 Corinthians 9, he tells them, You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. And it is the deaconing of this service. That's the same word again. That's in verse 1 of chapter 9. Um, that's over there in chapter 8. That's in Acts 11. It's the same word. The deaconing, which came from Acts 6. By their approval, uh, it says, by their uh, um, approval of this deaconing, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your uh, share or fellowship, partnership for them and for all others, while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you. Now, this is a, a share or a fellowship, just like Philippians was. In Philippians 4, Paul said, No church shared with me or partnered with me in, in giving and receiving except you alone. It's that same share or partnership. Where, you know, these churches consider themselves partners with Jerusalem insofar as they're giving of their means and they are sending money to help the saints there in their time of need. And the saints there will long for and pray for the churches out here because of the surpassing grace of God upon them. So the saints who are in Jerusalem will receive what they need because of the grace of God, because they have sent forth the word and because the word has made Christians and because Christians who love God love other Christians who love God and have chosen of their own um, free will to give so that these Christians in another place might be blessed. That's the whole, you know, that's the whole point here of what he says to them in verse 6 of chapter 9. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Notice that Paul does not say to them, you will get your money back or you will become wealthy. There is no prosperity gospel here. He said, all grace abounds to you so that you may abound in every good work. You may not get that money back, but you will have the opportunity to abound in good works for God, to glorify him still. In verse 9 you know, we're tempted to attribute to God, you know, that God is able to make all grace abound. God is distributed freely, given to the poor, and his righteousness endures forever. But that's not correct. The quotation is from Psalm 112, and the psalm is about the life of the righteous person. The righteous person distributes freely and gives to the poor. And because of this, the righteous person's righteousness endures forever. It's not about God. It's about you when you give. When you give bountifully, when you give cheerfully, um, when you trust God's grace to abound and make you sufficient for every good work. Well, that's the idea behind the, uh, the financial aid and the share or the partnership that we have as Christians, one with another in that regard. Now, Romans 15 also uh, taps into this. So not just Corinth, not just Antioch, but also Rome. Romans 15, starting at verse 25. Yes, Romans 15, 25. He said he wants to go through Rome on his way to Spain. However, 
At present, I'm going to Jerusalem, bringing aid to the saints. And that aid is the deaconing. It's that same word that happened in 2 Corinthians and in Acts. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. So he writes to Rome saying they are making a fellowship, a partnership. It's the same word that's in Philippians 4, for the partnership in giving and receiving. They have made, they've been pleased to make some contribution, or partnership for the poor among the saints of Jerusalem. They were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the nations have come to share in Jerusalem's spiritual blessings, well then, the nations ought also to be of service to Jerusalem in material blessings. That's the 27th verse. Which is an interesting thing. He's saying, look, Macedonia, meaning, you know, as we travel along the coastline here, we've gone up the, nor the northern side there. Um, you know, you've got uh, uh, Philippi, and then you have Berea, or rather, then you have Thessalonica, and then you have Berea as you come down the peninsula towards uh, Greece, which is Achaia, where Corinth is. Uh, if you keep going to the west, then you're getting over to Rome. And he's saying, I'm, look, I'm, I'm trying to get over to Spain, which is on the other side of Rome. Uh, but first, you know, I'm going back to Jerusalem because Macedonia and Achaia have given money for the church in Jerusalem that has need. And he said, they owe it to them. They're partaking in the spiritual blessings of Macedonia, or of the teachings that emanated from Jerusalem. The gospel, we all owe it. We're all benefactors of that spiritual teaching. Um, and it's an interesting thing, because he had written in Corinth, in uh, 1 Corinthians 9, he wrote to them saying, look, you know, if we have benefited you in spiritual things, is it so much if we reap material things? And it's the same principle that when Jerusalem is in need, as he says, well, you know, this is good. They owe it to them. They ought to give back some thanks for their, their souls that have been saved. And then the 30th verse, I appeal to you, brothers, by the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Spirit, strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. And you may have, uh, you may have guessed it, but that service for Jerusalem is the deaconing. And he's saying, I want to get there safely, I want to get there with the money, and I want the church there to accept the money from the nations. There's a little bit of, uh, you know, how's this going to go? Will they accept a monetary contribution from the Gentiles to support them as a result of the spiritual work that they have done? Right, so this is what is going on and what he's writing about. And it's an interesting thing, and, and that's, you know, that's really what he has in mind. You know, when you're looking at this in, in, uh, in 2 Corinthians, and I, I do want to look at it one more time, back here in aid. And In 2 Corinthians 8, verse, it's just going to be 8 to 14, and I'll stop. He said, I say this not as a command, meaning giving to the churches of Judea is not a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Is that double speak? No. It's an exchange of the physical and the spiritual. 
Christ is rich in that he exists with God, but he takes on the flesh and he comes to earth, he takes on the flesh, he's born to a poor family. And um, as was noted in, in prayer earlier, he was tormented to death. Though he was rich for our sake, he became poor so that by his poverty, we become rich. Not that we obtain physical prosperity, but that we have the salvation of our souls, which is worth far more than physical prosperity. You get to, you get to choose between being a billionaire and going to heaven, choose going to heaven. And it's, it's worth far more. In this matter, I give my judgment, he says in verse 10. This benefits you who a year ago started not only to do this work, but also to desire to do it. So now finish doing it too, so that your readiness in desiring it may be matched by your completing it out of what you have. If the readiness is there, it's acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he doesn't have. Right? So he's not asking for more than they can do. He's not saying you're obligated when you don't have anything to give. If you yourself are in need, how are you going to help somebody else's need? That's verse 13. I don't mean that others should be eased and you should be burdened, but that as a matter of fairness, your abundance at the present time should supply their need so that their abundance may supply your need so that there may be fairness. As it is written, whoever gathered much had nothing left over Whoever gathered little had no lack. Right, so the idea is not that we are burdened by giving. It's that we have a, a share. We do this at this time because we can help Jerusalem. Say if we're in Macedonia, if we're in Corinth or Rome, we can help Jerusalem. So we're going to send and help them. And we know that they would do the same for us if the tables were, were turned. But we also know that God will repay us in the spirit, regardless. And he said, there's fairness about this. Whoever gathered much had nothing left over. Whoever gathered little had no lack. This is a reference to the manna. And when God told them how to take the manna, which you may or may not remember, but basically, we'll summarize it. They were supposed to go out every day except for the Sabbath, and gather as much bread, manna, as was necessary for that person. And he gave them the portion, told them how much to gather per person or, you know, so that you knew how much you would, you would take. And the manna is distributed to all of Israel in that it's there for them to go get every day. But a person who lives alone takes a small amount. A person who has a family of 12 takes a large amount. But whoever gathered much had nothing left over, meaning when he took a bunch, it wasn't because he took more than he needed. He took what was necessary for his family, and whoever gathered little had no lack, meaning the person who took very little only needed very little. But everybody got what they needed is the point. Whether there were many of them or whether there were few of them, everybody got what they needed. And that's the idea, that God blesses the saints in such a way that we help one another and we make up and balance for times when some, some saints don't have what they need. Other saints may have abundance. And in so, uh, you know, when that is the case, you got to look at the scriptures and understand, well, we should do something for our brethren and have them in mind. And that's the idea behind the treasury. And that's the idea behind the relief and the, the deaconing, the service. So this is, um, you know, I mean, that's pretty, much, that's pretty much it right there. The service of the saints means that we have them in mind. As the churches uh, of Greece had... Uh, well, not just Greece, but the Greek-speaking churches, the Gentile churches, had Jerusalem in mind. And maybe we forget that, I guess. And it, I think it's good. I forget anyway. It's good to be reminded that we do owe them in Jerusalem. Um, you know, the entire Bible is written by Jews. Um, it, it's all 
you know, we owe Israel everything. From Israel, our Lord is descended. From, from Israel came all the prophets, all of the scriptures, all the apostles. Um, all of them were Israelites. And the whole world is blessed in that nation and the work of their hands. So yes, we do owe thanks to that ancient nation. Um, but now, of course, our spiritual blessings mean that we uh, return that thanksgiving to spiritual Israel. We return that to the saints who are uh, either working in the Lord and therefore have wages, or the saints who are widows who are enrolled and cared for by the church on a regular and uh, governed basis, or whether it be a time of need for the saints in another place where we help. This is just plain thanksgiving for what God has done for us. And it's a sharing and a getting dirty, you know. It's work and it's partnership. And it's, you know, rolling up your sleeves and, and getting your hands messy and doing the work with the saints knowing that God has got your back and that you'll be blessed in the end. Remember what Jesus said, whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Whoever would be first among you must be your slave. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. True, we, all of us, have benefited from what Jesus did, giving of himself and accepting terrible treatment to himself. If today you are not a Christian, you need to become a Christian to have forgiveness of sins, to be right with God, to have a clean slate and start over. But look at the goodness that is in the Lord. You know, the world is full of corruption and, and uh, I may not have to tell you that. It just depends on how old you are and whether or not you listen to the news. But the world is full of corruption. <laughs> uh, systems are not what you think they are. Um, justice is not where you think it should be. And uh, just because a thing is illegal doesn't mean that people don't do it. Uh, you know, you got to understand, that's just the way of the world. But look at the beauty that is in the church that God has set up. How we, all of us, are partaking in this larger uh, story that is the Bible, where, where we see how they conducted themselves. We learn from the manna that God distributes to everybody what they need, how we learn uh, from the way the churches uh, conducted themselves that you know sometimes we have more and we help those who have less. And we have an earnest concern and care for one another as brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. Yeah, the world is corrupt, but the church is a good place and it should be a good place. And there is blessing here. And, and if you want to make a difference in the world, then become a Christian. If you want to make justice and goodness in the world, then you become a Christian. That's what justice really is. That's when right is really done. Um, when people are really cared for. If you need to obey the gospel, we have water here prepared for you to be baptized in the name of Christ for forgiveness of sins. If you as a Christian have not lived right and need to repent, well, do it. Repent, make things right with God, and let us pray for you, because none of us is above temptation either. We need each other. We strengthen each other. Let the church be a place of blessings, a place of fairness, a place that is not corrupt as the world is, but rather a reminder that our Father is in heaven and our citizenship is in heaven. While we listen and we pray for governing authority and we are subject to governing authority and, and model citizens as Christians, we know that ultimately our citizenship is in heaven and it is God with whom we have to deal. So we'll always be fair in our dealings with men. Let us pray with you and for you if you need our, our help. If you need to obey the gospel, let it be known. Either way, please do so by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected.